Okay. Welcome to the Compete to Title, Complete to Compete Title III program. We're glad you're with us. This program is brought to you by UAS Juno and Sitka Career Services programs. Please put your questions on the chat box and Deborah will answer them at the conclusion of the session. Today's program is resumes and cover letters. Our presenter is Deborah Reidman. Deborah is a University of Alaska Juno Campus Career Service Coordinator, but she's for all three campuses, including Ketchikan and Sitka. She has over 15 years of experience working with high school and state job centers and has been working at the UAS Juno campus for over eight years with students and alumni. And from my experience, my advice is pay attention. She knows what she's talking about. Wonderful. Thank you, Jeff. And mm -hmm. thank you all for joining us today. You know, resumes and cover letters can be confusing to job seekers. And what type of resume is best, for example? What should you include in a cover letter? There are so many choices of formats. Which one should you use? Today's session will strive to answer these questions as well as provide some clarity on what employers are really looking for when it comes to resumes and cover letters. We'll begin first with resumes and then we'll move uh, to cover letters after that. So let me encourage you, as we did at the very first slide, if you could grab something to take some notes with, because there's going to be some content that will be covered that is not part of the presentation. It also allows you a chance to write down some questions that you might have that uh, we're going to cover at the end of the session. So I always like to begin with a, with a WIFM, what's in it for me? And so for this session, we're gonna go over how resumes have changed and why a lot has changed in the last 10 years. I've been an employment specialist for the Employment Security Department down in Seattle, and that's what a lot, where a lot of changes started to occur is during that time. So we're gonna go over what those are and what those mean to you. And then the importance of targeting. Uh, this is extremely important and so we're going to take a look at what employers want to see when it comes to targeting your resume to a specific position. And then sometimes the whole idea of targeting your resume seems a little bit overwhelming. So I'm going to show you a technique that makes it really easy. And in my opinion, just because I love employment services, I think it's really kind of fun too. So uh, I'll be able to pass that on to you. And then the importance of numbers. Metrics really jump out in resumes. And so we're gonna take a look at some examples of how you can incorporate numbers or metrics into different uh, statements within your resume. And then we'll take a look at some resume examples. And also an example of electronic resume, which are becoming a little bit more familiar and common, and it gives you a chance to be able to create one and then hyperlink it uh, within certain situations. Following this session, the examples that we'll be looking at, uh, we'll be emailing those. They're Word documents that you can, that you can use uh, yourself. So um, it'll give you a chance to try on some of these, uh, some of these types. So what has changed? What has changed is technology. The one page resume is a thing of the past because employers are using what they call applicant tracking systems or ATSs to screen and score resumes. So really, oftentimes your resume, when you, uh, when you apply for a position online, it goes into an ATS and the algorithms that the hiring manager has put into the ATS is scoring your resume based on what they've told the computer to look for. And then only those resumes with the top scores move on to the hiring manager. So in a lot of cases, you're going against a computer, not a person. Now, what I found out here in Alaska after moving here from the Seattle area, the ATSs weren't as common here in Alaska. Um, Search, for example, which is our Southeast Alaska Regional Health Consortium, uh, they do, they did implement an ATS probably about eight years ago. And so, but what it does for 50 bucks a month, companies can use an ATS and it really makes their recruiting processing a lot easier. 
So, so we have to keep that in mind. So what that does is it drives us back to the job posting because that's where they're going to pull some of the algorithms uh, that they're going to include for the screening process. So as a result, it makes more content for the resumes. And so the longer resumes are more common because of technology. So oftentimes I will run into, you know, students or alumni where they feel like they have to have a one page resume. And so it's frustrating when you're trying to get all the content that you want to put down in one page. And so unless an employer say, uh, states specifically that they want a one page resume, you can give yourself permission to go into a longer resume. But the key thing is the content needs to be relevant and the content is driven by the job posting. So the very first thing when I meet with students and alumni and they are looking at jobs and they want to apply for positions and they're uh, seeking assistance with that is I always ask them if they could send me the link to the job posting because that is the very first place that we start. So we take a look at the job posting and then we go from there to make the match with the students or the alumni's resume. So we'll be looking at the direct experience that the student or alumni has, and then some possible transferable skills that you can relate to on or include on your resume. So let's take a look at how this would work. So here's an example of a job posting that we found online. And the very first thing that I do is we go through it line by line and start to underline, identify different parts of the job position that the student possesses in some context. So for example, you can see uh, arranging meetings is underlined. And so if a student has had experience arranging meetings in any type of a context, and here's the other thing, when I say any type of a context, it could be through paid work experience, it could be through internships, uh, volunteering, community service. Uh, in the state of Alaska, there's a lot of things that go on that students are involved with on a community level. And so there are skills that you are using in a lot of different ways. And so we want to be able to capture those ways as much as possible in your resume. And so when you underline like in this example, arranging meetings, then I have the students just kind of write in above, okay, I did it in this, this particular situation, I did this in this job, et cetera, and then we'll make sure that we include something about arranging meetings in those areas on their resume. So as you can see, the job posting drives the content of what we're going to include on the resume. And what's really fun about this process is it's empowering for students because all of a sudden they think, I've done this, you know, and I've done this on a few different, uh, you know, levels. And so, so then they realize it's like, yeah, I can do this job. And then that's where we start. And then we go to build the resume from there. Now, when you're trying to target your resume to a job position, then this is the technique that I used when I moved here from the Seattle area nine years ago, eight, actually eight years ago. So when I was into job search, I would go into the position that I was interested in applying for, and I would literally copy and paste some of the points in the job posting that I thought are important to the employer that I want to see if I can address. So this document, we will be emailing to you following the session. But this is an example of what I actually did for a position that I applied for. So I copy and pasted the major duty and responsibilities, the bullet points there. And then as you can see underneath, I built how I had those particular, uh, you know, skills and experience. So as you can see, the very first one, it says maintaining all accounting document files, new files, uh, timely filing and organizing. And I address that by stating that I had over two plus years experience maintaining personnel files. Now here's an example of transferable skills. I don't have direct experience with accounting department files, 
but I do have direct experience working with personnel files. So the employer can see that I have developed the skill and then I'll be able to transfer that skill over to this particular context. And then I just finished, make sure uh, you can notice too, the, uh, the last part of that statement that I created, it says filing documents. And so you see the word filing right above in a timely manner. That was just my, my addition, as well as maintaining organization of files. And so you see above, there is the word organizing. So what you do, which makes it really easy, is you use their words. So, and then you just modify them or go into a little bit more detail uh, with your experience. And that way you can catch some of those keywords and phrases that uh, might be inputted into the ATS. Now take a look at the third bullet down uh, that I was using to create my, uh, you know, my content for my resume. Yeah. And it says, assisting with accounting records retention. And as you can see, no experience, delete. So I just, you know, deleted that out and then went on to the next one. So you're gonna come across certain points in the job posting where uh, you don't really have direct experience or you can't really find any transferable experience or skills. So you just move on and you continue with the other points that you want to include that the employer is looking for. Now, the other part that is really important is using numbers. So, Here's a document that will go into some detail about writing descriptive statements. But I'd like you to take a look at this section. So take a moment, if you would, and read through the three examples and notice the difference between them. Isn't the best awesome? I mean, oh my goodness, when you look at the good, the better, and the best, the best really stands out. And this is what we need to do with resumes now, is we need to go into some detail because of the ATS. But let me ask you this, and you can, uh, you know, answer hypothetically, or also put something in the text or in the chat box if you'd like. But what really stood out to you? What was, what was one point in that best example that stood out to you that your eyes went to first? So go ahead and enter your answers into the chat box. So everybody sees things a little bit different, but the thing that typically stands out to most people are the numbers. And so you may have you may have noticed 15 or 2000 and if you can include numbers quantifying uh, your experience then that makes for a stronger statement that has more impact. So here's what I want you to do when you're looking at the different uh, points that you want to include and, and create statements for your resumes is ask yourself can I quantify this experience? I ask uh, the students and alumni that I work with, uh, tell me how many times did you do this on a weekly basis? And so we take a look if we can quantify anything within that statement and then we include it. Now, if it's not a really strong number, hello, then we just don't. So, so it's totally fine. This is, thank you so much for calling. Okay, uh, and then just, just uh, for those of you who are joining us, if you could also please mute your microphone and we'll have a chance to have some conversations after our session, but if you could mute your microphone for now. Thank you. So we're gonna go into the different types of resumes that we have. And we're gonna take a look at the three common ones. We have uh, chronological, functional, and the combination. So let's take a look at what those include. 
Now this format. Oh, so I'm going to give you my whole legal name, which I'm pretty sure to leave it. Be so this format, um, so we're going to go through them section by section, and then uh, that'll and explain then a little bit know. about that. So and uh, yes. hey, Jeff, could you mute Cat for us, please? I think you can do that as a co-host. Um, eight. Okay. Five. So the very first, the very first section that we're going to look at is the heading. And as you'll notice, the heading is minimal. It just has the name, the phone number, the email address, and the location. And one thing that you need to keep in mind as well is you need to have a professional email address. And we recommend also having an email address that has a part of your name, preferably your last name. And in this example, we have the C for the first name and town is the last name. Because when your application comes in to an employer and it makes its way into their inbox, then that name recognition will help them find you if they want to reply to you. So keeping it in the, in the heading is uh, what we recommend. And then also, if you don't have a professional email address, uh, we all have our personal email addresses. So if you could create a professional email address that has your last name in it, then, um, then that will kind of separate your job search from your personal emails, which is great. Now, another note on this, you can see that Juneau, Alaska is listed here. You don't have to necessarily put the city of your location at this stage yet because it could maybe uh, pre-screen you out for a job because they may be concerned about relocation expenses or commutes. When I was working for uh, the Employment Security Department down in Seattle, uh, I was working in the area that was about 30 miles north of Seattle, so around that area, but still a bit of a commute. And we were finding out that some employers in the downtown Seattle area were pre-screening our clients out because they didn't want to worry about the commute. And if you've been to Seattle or if you've lived in Seattle, the commute is awful. And sometimes it can take an hour to get uh, from somewhere north into the city of Seattle. So we just decided, okay, let's take off the, the city and then um, hopefully that they wouldn't be uh, pre-screened out as a result of that. The second thing is the objective, and this is what we call a targeted objective. So it has the title of the position, the company that it's with, and the location of that company. There are companies that have multiple recruitments going on at the same time. And so a very clean targeted objective helps them identify what specific job or recruitment this particular applicant has submitted their application for. And so this is a really quick change. So you can change the name or the title of the position and then include the location because they might also have several different jobs going on in different locations, especially if uh, the application processes or applications are going directly to their corporate office. So, so that's the objective. There has been some conversation about the objective falling off, but our employers in the Seattle area were telling us that this is helpful because uh, they can make sure that they don't miss out on any applicants. This section is called the summary qualification. And so this is the section that is like your quick uh, advertisement. And everything in this section is driven by the job posting. And as the ATS is scanning from the top down, you want to include this, uh, the, the pertinent information from the job posting in this section as, as much as possible. And so as I'm working with students and as we start to highlight and underline the different parts of the job posting that we can address, then we will also go and take a look at which points did the employer list first because oftentimes those are the ones that they are most interested in. So we'll look at that to see if we have a statement that can address that bullet point and then just get a blend of the rest to make sure that we cover as much as possible, quantify if we can, as you can see, there's an example of that here. 
this is like, again, a quick snapshot of what you bring to the table, but the intention is to uh, score, start to score higher on the ATS as it is scanning. And just uh, another note with the objective above, um, we're working with uh, job seekers who were interested in applying for jobs with Boeing. And at Boeing, they had, you know, they would hire a lot and then they would lay off people. It, would, it was definitely very cyclical. So we were in a really strong hiring uh, phase with them. And the other thing that scored high on their ATS, which is a very sophisticated ATS, is also including the job number. So there's always a job number associated with a job recruitment. And so that number uh, correlates exactly with that job recruitment. So we would include that and we heard that that scored higher on the ATS. So, so we wanna pay attention to those kinds of things. So the summary of qualifications definitely is um, the highlights that you wanna include. The next section is core competencies. And if you could take some notes down, uh, another way to view this is minimum or preferred qualifications. So you go directly to the minimum of preferred qualifications. And in the example that you'll be uh, receiving here uh, later today, it has six different cells, so to speak, six, six different bullet points that you can include both the required and the preferred qualifications. And in this example, and you will see by, uh, by the, Word, the Word document that you'll be emailed, you can use just four bullet points and maybe there's only four that you can find that you wanna include and you can eliminate that last row. This is a table that is built into the Word document. So it allows you to modify it so you can just delete that last row and bring it down to four but only do four or six, do not do more than six. And you wanna hit the main points with minimum requirements and preferred qualifications in this section. Now, something else that's a little bit different is when you get down to your professional experience, as you can see, the title of, the, of your position is bolded. The company that you work for is italicized and then you have the month and year to month and year listed off to the right. So you want to highlight you, the employee, by bolding your job title, and then the company is just kind of secondary. Then underneath that, there is a statement or two, it could be one or two, you will see in this example, some of these statements are a little bit longer, but it just gives some context of the business or the organization. That way the, le uh, the reader can see, okay, what kind of a place is this? What type of a agency is this? What is their purpose? What do they do, et cetera? So you can go into a little bit of detail to again, give context to the reader. Now the bullet points that are listed underneath, those bullet points were crafted during the targeting technique exercise that you went through and you're basically just going to copy and paste the bullet points that you created as they fit under your work experience. So again, you know, the, uh, the job posting is driving the content of your resume. And so you've already created that. So then it's just a matter of inserting it, which is pretty great. So in my opinion, it makes it really kind of fun because you're using their words and, and their content to be able to build your resume. You don't have to come up with it from scratch, which is a good thing. And the next type of resume is what I call a chronological combination. And everything is pretty much the same, except in this particular case, I had a student that had some experience um, previously and also the education was really key to the position that uh, the student was applying for. And so we move the education up. Typically the education is the very last section in a resume. So we move the education up so we could show the reader that they had the certification that was required for that position. And then right below, we have relevant experience. And so in this case, 
this relevant experience was specific to the practicum of the uh, degree program that she was pursuing. And so we put that front and center and then the work experience, we also wanted to show some customer service experience. And so we put that underneath. So it's just a little bit of a reorder and the relevant experience is something that is oftentimes in this example is specific to the job that they're applying for. But in some, in some cases, it might be some experience like maybe five years ago. So it, it's not similar to the chronological and the chronological is in reverse chronological order with your most recent, your next most recent, your next most recent. And so, um, so we kind of rearrange it a bit to really focus and highlight the things that uh, you want the reader to see. Now the next type of resume is called a functional resume. This is the least favorite format for employers, but what this format works well with uh, uh, people who don't have a lot of work experience or if they've developed skills that they've never really used or had a job or an internship um, that was specific to those types of skills. <clears throat> so in this case, we use this a lot for our student assistants in our IT department because, as you know, students have been using information technology computers for most of their lives. And so we, don't, we can't really show work experience, but we can show skill sets. And so for the relevant experience, we divide it into skill sets. And so in this case, uh, we have the computer skills. And again, everything that is listed here was found in the job posting. And then there's some customer service, which was also asked for in the job posting. So we include that. And then the work history is underneath. And then in this case, the student did have an actual customer service position. And so we listed the kinds of things that um, that student did for the work history. So, and again, this is relevant to the job that they're applying for. And oftentimes when you are uh, including your, your work history and you have the bullet points, of course you go first to the job posting and develop your bullet points from there. But you can also include a bullet point that you think might be of interest. So if you're bilingual, um, if you have something that you think an employer would really value, then go ahead and include that in the summary qualifications uh, or also within your work history or core competencies. So, um, so don't feel like you can't include certain things, but always look at it through the lens of what you think an employer would value and then go from there. And the other thing, please reach out to your career services offices because uh, we are here to help if you want a review of your resume or if you have a question that's like, okay, I'm not sure if I should include this or not, then we have staff members at each campus that are ready to help you um, when you need it. So please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Now this particular resume this is called a functional resume with coursework. And so the difference with this is oftentimes while you're in college, you are taking classes that you're developing a lot of skills, um, a lot of knowledge base that is going to be of interest to the employer. And if you don't have any direct or relevant type of internship experience or job experience, then you can go to your coursework. And in this particular example, the student didn't have any internship experience. And as you can see from the position he was applying to, it was a marine mammal technician. And so his coursework was going to be the best place to show the relevant experience. He did have some research ex assistant experience, so we included that, so that was a bonus. But then we went right into the coursework and I had him look at his transcript to see which courses he thought would be most relevant to include in this resume. And so he chose marine ecology and marine mammalogy. Then we went to the course catalog and literally copy and pasted the description of the course from the course catalog and then modified it to tense to show that the student had completed the, the course. 
and then also included bullet points that would be of interest to the employer looking back again at the job posting. And this is one of those situations where you can maybe include some additional bullet points based on the assignments or the projects that you completed as part of the course uh, that you think would be of value or of interest to the employer. This is another thing too that I encourage students to hang on to their syllabi because they can go back and take a look at what they did because oftentimes when you finish a course, you're just like, you know, I don't remember that. And then you have to go back and try to figure out what you did. So it's nice to have that available. And I have heard that the syllabi are, and the syllabus are there available online. So if that's the case, um, that would be great. But I would encourage you just to make sure that you have a copy of, of uh, the syllabus of your coursework and then you'll be ready to go. Now, here's something really interesting about the state of Alaska. When I first came on board with UAS eight years ago, I was talking to students and they were telling me that they were having a hard time securing interviews with the state of Alaska. They would apply, but they never got an invitation to interview. And so I actually invited the director of personnel for the state to find out what they're looking for. Because what was curious is I found in the job postings for jobs with the state that they asked for a cover letter. And typically a cover letter is a three paragraph kind of a document and we'll look at those here in a moment. But in, in this case, their cover letter is really essentially the resume. And so after talking with, um, with the director of personnel and finding out what they're looking for, I put together this template. And in this example, here you'll see the job posting number. So we include that under regarding and the job posting number. Please make a note if you could. This is not the PCN number, the position control number. So you're going to see a PCN number, which is a classification system within the HR field. And what that does is it identifies the accounting clerk as a general kind of a description. Now the job number is the number that's specific for that recruitment. So you wanna put the job number in this particular field if you're applying for a job with the state of Alaska. And then after that, uh, we go down to the minimum qualifications and what we do, you basically copy and paste which minimum qualifications you meet and then you bullet point how you meet those qualifications. And then the next section that is usually the case with jobs with the state is knowledge, skills, abilities, and experience. And then again, you go and copy and paste the bullet points from the job posting and you address how you possess those particular knowledge, skills, abilities, and experience. So putting together a cover letter with the state of Alaska is actually kind of fun because you can use their words the bullet points direct you and then you simply qualify how you possess those and give examples of how you do. And you can pull these examples from again either work experience, volunteer, internship, coursework, so whatever you want to do, however you can best address these different bullet points, then you want to do that. Now, above the minimum qualifications, you'll see three paragraphs. We're going to go into those three paragraphs a little bit more in detail here uh, in a moment. But these are the main points with a cover letter that is technically the resume for the state of Alaska. Now, I will say that things have changed a bit with recruitments with the state of Alaska. And so the cover letter is still required for positions that are at a three or four or five level. If you have a chance, if you've had a chance to look at jobs with the state of Alaska, you will see some of those numbers after some of the jobs that are posted. The one and two level, they're using supplemental questions. But with those supplemental questions, you can use the same technique as is shown here for the knowledge, skills, and abilities. 
you can copy and paste the, um, the question and then again qualify it with an example of when and how you possessed or learned that particular skill. The other thing that you can do, and I would highly recommend it because you don't know where you might be able to use this, is to create an electronic resume. And I don't know if you've had the chance to use Canva, but it's a pretty amazing program. So it's free also, and there's lots of templates that you can choose from. I put this together a few years ago as I was learning Canva and I loved the opportunities and the different formats that you could use as well as different sections that you could highlight. So it's very creative, but it also gives you a chance to put down your experience. And this is kind of like a, a master resume. You would modify this for different positions. And then it also allows you to include letters of recommendation you can also include on a portfolio some of the projects that you've worked with and so it really does a good job of covering things in a more creative way. Wix is another program that is also very user friendly so I would encourage you to try both out and see if you can put something together. You'll see several different examples of resumes. You can also use examples of other types of formats uh, like flyers that you might like and you can modify them into a resume. But check it out and then what you can do is you can hyperlink this resume in your heading or you can also hyperlink it under your signature for your email. I did that with my job search. I used another kind of a platform to uh, show uh, showcase um, my experience and my resume in an electronic format and I inserted that under my signature uh, for my email address. So it's something fun to have and people, you can actually, I think some places you can track how many people have viewed it. So check it out. If you need a kind of a creative outlet, this is definitely fun and it, you can take some time just to build it, but it's, it's a good thing for you to have. Okay, we're gonna move on to cover letters. Now, I don't know about you, but I know a lot of people have been confused about what to include in a cover letter. It almost seems like a cover letter is an enigma, and I get it because it's hard to really know what employers are looking for. And so we're going to cover what employers are looking for when it comes to cover letters. We're going to take a look first at the statistics from an HR viewpoint, talk about the content, where to start, what a great cover letter should include, and some examples of three types of cover letters that you can navigate or traffic between depending on which one would maybe be the best for a particular situation. So here are the numbers. I found this really interesting. Because a lot of times you think, okay, what's a cover letter about? I don't know if they're gonna read it, etc. But the reality is, 83% say cover letters are important to their hiring decision. So that's a pretty big number. So that is convincing. The power of a good cover letter. And if, if you get the interview, even if your resume isn't good enough, because a cover letter can definitely help and offset a resume that may not be as strong. So 83% of the time that happens, which is interesting. And if any of you have been hiring managers in the past and you see your resume and you go, huh? And then you read the cover letter, you go, huh, okay. I think I might put this application in the maybe pile. And that's what they're doing. They're sorting through the applicants and putting applications into either the maybe pile or the no pile. So you want to get in the maybe pile and a good cover letter can definitely help you uh, do that. The other thing that's interesting, if a cover letter is optional, 77% of recruiters get preference to candidates who submit a cover letter. There is a kind of a fine line where if they don't ask for it, then, you know, are you following directions? 
in cases like that, if you wonder about that, I think it's a good idea to get in touch with the contact person for that position if possible. And if not, err on the side of including a cover letter. Because as you will see here in just a moment, uh, a cover letter can have a huge advantage to uh, explaining a little bit more about you as an applicant to the hiring manager. The other thing I would strongly encourage you to do as a practice, make sure that you save the job postings of the positions or internships that you're applying for because you're gonna to need to go back to those perhaps later to prepare for an interview. And we'll talk about that at our session on Tuesday, but you need to go back and check the job posting again, review it for clues that you want to include in your resume and you'll be able to identify both direct and uh, transferable skills. So what is the purpose of a cover letter? I see it as a rapport building opportunity. With resumes, you are not, uh, you should not ever put in personal pronouns like I did this, I did that. Resumes are simply statements. A cover letter, you can be more personal. You can include personal pronouns. Then also you want to make sure that it's a professional business format. I prefer all left hand justified. And then the other thing that's really, really important and we would require this of the customers that we're working with in Seattle is to personally address it. Do your homework to find the person that is associated with this recruitment. Do a little sleuthing online go to their website to see if you can find an org chart. And as a last resort, if you're having a hard time coming up with it, then give them a call. And you can simply have a, a quick conversation with uh, whoever answers the phone and just tell them that you are putting together a cover letter and you'd like to personalize it to the hiring manager and if you could possibly get the name of the hiring manager. Make sure that you also ask for the correct spelling because uh, for example, Chris could be spelled with a K or a C or who knows what. So make sure that you get the correct spelling if you're talking to somebody on the phone. The other thing that it does is it articulates your value to the company or the organization. So you'll have another opportunity to do that in a more conversational tone. And then the other thing that's really, really important about cover letters is to make sure that you include a part that uh, specifically highlights the company. True story, kind of a funny story. We reached out to our hiring managers in Seattle because we were hearing that they really weren't paying attention as much to the cover letters because um, there was a lot of hiring going on at that time. And so we found out from them, we asked them, what are you looking for? And they told us that they like to read about themselves in a cover letter, which I found fascinating. I thought, okay, if that's what you want, then that's what we're going to deliver. So I'm going to show you in some of these examples how to do that. There's a couple of different ways. The other thing that's really important, and I've uh, worked with this with our students and alumni, Oftentimes a cover letter just focuses on the student because they, you know, they're anxious to get the job. They want to show their value, which is absolutely understandable, but we have to apply a shift because the, the cover, the resume is about you. It's about your experience, but a cover letter is really about them. We want the focus to be on them. And that's where that, that last bullet point that I was just talking about is really, really important. So, so you have to kind of keep it in mind is, you know, what value you're showing that you offer them, but also what is it about them that really interests you and why you want to apply for a job with their company. So here are some sections. The heading is basically the same. As you can see, the, the heading is the same format as the resume. You want your marketing materials that include your resume cover letter and your reference list, which is a separate document, to look the same. So however you design it, make sure that you replicate it with your documents. Here's an example of how to personalize your cover letter. It's their name, it's their title, it's their company. 
Also include the job title and the job number, similar to what we just looked at with the cover letter with the state of Alaska, because again, if they have multiple recruitments coming in, this will definitely help them. The first paragraph is your intro paragraph. So where did you find it? How did you hear about it? You can read about this in the example that we'll be emailing to you after this session. So you can kind of see what it looks like, but you can also always, in fact, I encourage include your voice, but you can see, uh, use this for inspiration on how to start to create your intro paragraph. The second paragraph is the value that you would bring to the position. Oftentimes, applicants, students, alumni, they have a really great story. So, so what is the evolution of why they became interested, how they developed that, where they took that, and, and this is all relevant to the position they're applying for. All the different things that they have gained through work experience, personal experience, etc. So include as much as you can about what you bring how you became interested, what um, motivated you for a position like this, uh, especially with your vocational goal. So if you include your vocational goal and the, and the evolution of that, that's interesting. So you can include that kind of information in this paragraph. The last paragraph is about them. What you can do to find the content for this paragraph is you go online, you might jot this down in the notes, that you're taking, go online and look for their mission statement, for their vision statement, and then capture a part of that that resonates with you and talk a little bit about why that is. You can also do a Google search on what's new, different projects that they've been in, included on, anything that you can find that you can mention. The other thing, if you have personal experience, if you've been a customer for this particular uh, company, then you can include your experience here. So talking about them, that's what you want to leave them with. And then at the bottom, it's always nice to sign off in a professional way. And in this example, there is a cursive font that we use. You can also, if you have created an electronic signature where you basically write your signature and then capture an image of that and then you can insert this because everything is being uh, submitted electronically. So you can do that. And it's a courtesy phone call just to put or phone, put your phone number down at the bottom so they don't have to go up and find it. So that's how you finish out your cover letter. Now this is a cover letter that's really outside of the box, but I love it. And if I were in a job search position, I would definitely look at this because this would be the one I would hope to send. But it is definitely un un excuse me, unconventional, so you have to kind of use your gut to decide if this is something you might want to try out. But the difference between this and the cover letter that we just looked at is we pull the focus about them right up at the front. And in this example, we took a look at the different things that the department had accomplished and we bullet pointed each one of them. So we were acknowledging to the hiring manager that we know what you've been doing and it's pretty incredible. That tells them that you've done your homework and you recognize the value that they recognize about themselves, the things that they can feel proud about as an employer. Then underneath is the value that you bring and we glean these different words from the job posting. Oftentimes they're just right there. Otherwise you can kind of create some words and then describe how you possess those different attributes. So this is a fun one, so I'd encourage you when you get the example, you can read it over. And again, all of these are in Word format, so you can modify them uh, to use in the future. And then the state of Alaska cover letter, we've already gone through that. But um, this is just one of those things that are different. Okay, well that concludes the content of our session today. 
Next week on Tuesday, we'll be covering virtual interviews. This is what most employers are doing right now, of course, in light of COVID. So for this session, we'll be going through how to prepare, hitting on some main points, and then how to get yourself set up uh, successfully to make sure that you come across the way you want to come across in a virtual interview. We'll also look at some things that could go wrong and then what do you do to mitigate those particular situations. So it's really, it's a, definitely a fun session and it'll make you feel more confident when preparing for an interview. A lot of times we get anxious about interviews and the one thing to make sure that um, we can do to alleviate some of that anxiety is preparation. So we'll go through those things at the session next Tuesday, same time. You can register for those sessions via Handshake or on our online workshop registration form. All right. Uh, on behalf of the Complete to Compete program, I want to thank you for attending and hope you'll join us again on the virtual interview.